The mid 2010s saw a massive buying spree by some of China's biggest multinational companies. Wielding huge pocketbooks, these companies bought and attempted to buy some of the world's most valuable assets. In this video, we look at one of China's most controversial corporate halls, the German company KUKA. This purchase became intensely political and heralded a new attitude of suspicion towards Chinese money. But first, I want to take the time to ask you to subscribe to the Asianometry newsletter. I'm starting to get on a bit of a roll in putting out new original content that's in addition to what you might find in the videos. A few of you first stumbled on this channel because of the TSMC content that I've been putting out recently. It's been a real pleasure to write and share what I've learned, as well as my thoughts on the company and the industry. I just recently finished up a retouch of the TSMC explainer that I first wrote over two years ago when I first began posting about the subject. Expect to see that soon on the Agenometry newsletter. You can find the link to the newsletter in the video description below, or you can just go to Asianometry.com. Subscribe and I'll try to make it worth your while, and you can expect a new newsletter every four days at 1 a.m. Taiwan time. Thanks. So I want to start with a question. Why should I care? Why does this matter? Am I being racist, singling out China and the such? I want to go over kind of what worries policymakers. Large Chinese companies are often perceived as being extensions of Chinese Communist Party policy. This is the case even when on the surface they do not seem to be state-owned, as in their shares are not directly held by the state. This is for several reasons. For one thing, 5% of Chinese quote-unquote private companies are under the direct control of high-ranking party members. In addition, what influence means in China is extremely informal and hard to track, for example, family lines and the such. Additionally, every Chinese company of a certain size is obligated to establish a Communist Party committee for its members. This is ostensibly for the purpose of organizing social events for the company's employees who are also party members. But I think it's hard to take that at face value. And then third, Chinese companies who go abroad need the permission of the government to do so. This is due to China's capital controls on the RMB. It is extremely difficult to get money out otherwise. These Chinese MNCs started going abroad and buying abroad at the behest of a stated party policy, the going global policy. Okay, there's that part. Now let's go to the other side. Let's look at China's branded 2015 policy called Made in China 2025. Beijing's goal here is to move up the industrial value chain and own the underlying technologies of doing so. Not that there is anything wrong with them wanting to do so, it's entirely in their rights to do so, but it's also entirely within other countries' rights not to help themselves get muscled out of their place. Based on these publicly announced government policies, it's easy to come to the conclusion that Chinese companies are acting in service of their foreign policy by acquiring sophisticated high-end technology for transfer back home. Which, if you live in a strictly libertarian, efficiency-only outcome world, might be perfectly fine for you. Money for tech a fair exchange made by two consenting parties, freedom to buy, sell, the like, yada yada. But for a policymaker looking out for their country's own economic position, as well as their own election chances, that's a problem. German-Chinese relations had been going quite well throughout the 2010s. The weak economic situation in Europe in 2010 had forced German companies to woo the Chinese as a market for their exports. The relationship warmed considerably with newly middle-class Chinese consumers buying German products, especially cars, in large numbers. As the partnership progressed, Germany increasingly aligned with China's views on certain items and policies. In 2014, China grew to be Germany's fourth largest export partner and second largest import partner. Value goods exported to China from Germany uh, from the 2008 to 2014 period was 74 billion euro up 118% over the previous years. Imports rose to 80 billion euro, up 34%. Even though there was a trade deficit, things were going good enough for the government to brush aside complaints from German companies about the issues of doing business in China, especially the technology transfer question. But as 2015 approached, an ill wind blew through the Chinese-German marital home. 
At first, German politicians saw Chinese investments in German companies as an opportunity. Chinese money can help take over failing German companies, reform them, and bring them up to snuff. In a country with a rather conservative banking culture, Chinese money could help serve as helpful private equity. Then, starting around 2014, Chinese investment in Germany suddenly jumped. Up until 2013, it had been stuck at roughly around 0.6 billion euro. In 2014, it hit abruptly 1 billion. The next year, 2 billion. And this 1 or 2 billion figure likely underestimates the actual amount invested. Has Chinese investors prefer to make their buys to Luxembourg shell companies? But what alarmed politicians was more what that money was going into. Chinese investors were buying big stakes in Germany's leading technology companies. These include Avic Group, which does aeronautic equipment, Kroos Mafe, I probably got that name wrong, plastic and rubber goods. Or EEW Energy, which is renewable energy. This is in contrast to the struggling laggards that German politicians had at first thought that Chinese money would go for. Considering that China continued to block European investment in its own leading technology companies, this began to rub people the wrong way. 2016, the year of Trump's election, would see the start of the investment dilemma. KUKA was founded in 1898. In Augsburg, Germany, the company started out making light products and household appliances before pivoting to autonomous wielding products. Over the years, the company gained a leading position in the industrial robotics space, with a specialty in automotive. It employs over 13,000 people across 25 countries. Kuka robots are in some of the world's most advanced industrial factories. Their customers include Boeing, SpaceX, Airbus, GM, Chrysler, Volkswagen, and others. Their robots are prominent not only in automotive assembly but also aerospace, retail, rail, and more. The company's robots have been featured in music videos, movies, and more. One might even say that they are somewhat iconic. You would also agree that the technology behind their manufacture and operation is extremely valuable and hard-earned. But is this technology up for sale at any price? Let's take a look. Kuka had been one of the companies that had a large stake purchased by Chinese investors. Guangdong-based Meidi Group bought 5.4 percent of Kuka stock in 2015. Meidi makes lighting goods, laundry, and cooking appliances, amongst others. Their main business appears to be in making air conditioners. Founded in 1968, the company made 21 billion in revenue in 2015. Its co-founder He Shangjian. Today is one of China's richest men, with a fortune of 36 billion. Mei Di is publicly listed on the Shenzhen Stock Exchange, and does not appear to have any direct ties to the Chinese government. For what it's worth, Chinese Premier Li Keqiang and Mei Di Group Vice President Andy Gu have emphasized that Mei Di is a private company. Mei Di bought more of Kuka's publicly traded stock going into. 2016, raising its stake to 10.2 percent. This made Meidi the second largest investor after German industrial group Voith with 25. They declared that they wanted to invest even more money into Kuka, with Kuka's advanced robotics and automation technology being their interest. Then, in May 2016, Meidi bought out a stunning offer for Kuka, 4.5 billion euro. This is a big premium over the current market price, 60% higher than the February 2016 stock price. People had concern with this acquisition. Kuka's robots are used in the world's most advanced factories. An acquirer could possibly get access to all of its customers' knowledge and know-how. Meidi knew this and unveiled its acquisition plan accordingly. They acquired shares in Kuka slowly, step by step, in order to dissipate public anger. The company's management and supervisory boards came out in strong support of the deal. Meidi had signed agreements restricting it from corporate reorganizations and the such for 7.5 years. And of course, there was the money. 4.5 billion euro is a nice payout. The offer was so high that when the German government attempted to shop around for an alternative European buyer from the likes of Siemens or ABB, they had no takers. European companies simply did not believe that Kuka was worth that much. 
In August 2016, Berlin approved the acquisition of 94.5% of KUKA's shares. In the end, even if the German government wanted to block the acquisition, it did not have the legal apparatus to do so. They could not even do a formal inquiry into the acquisition unless it touched on sensitive sectors like power and water safety or telecommunications. In the United States, it was a different story. In my video about Tsinghua Unigroup, I mentioned the Committee on Foreign Investment, CFIS. It is authorized by law to investigate acquisitions relating to U.S. interests and, if necessary, force blocks or divestments. CFIS had blocked Tsinghua from acquiring major stakes in American semiconductor makers. KUKA has U.S. subsidiaries, so CFIS got involved. In December 2016, KUKA carved out its U.S. aeronautics subsidiary and sold it to Texas-based automation firm AIT Inc., not to be confused with the American Institute in Taiwan. I must note that Chinese law would have also prevented KUKA from holding the subsidiary anyway, as the U.S. subsidiary had close ties to American arms manufacturers. This carve-out sale appeared to satisfy CFIS and they approved the acquisition in late December. I will note that this is after Trump's election, but before he took office. Considering what CFIS has been up to since 2016, I wonder if it would have approved the acquisition today. The fallout from the KUKA acquisition will last. On Germany's side, what they saw was a Chinese company acquiring really high-end technology, technology expertise that have been built up over the course of 100 years. It's not really easy to get that. In July 2016, KUKA announced a joint venture with a subsidiary of Chinese state-owned military enterprise China South Industries Group Corp. to help manufacturers automate their operations. I don't know about you, but whenever I see the words China and joint venture, I think technology transfer. From the Chinese perspective, there is a bitter taste left in the mouth by the whole experience. They bought the company, they own it and everything it makes. They paid hard currency for it. No German law made it illegal to buy automation or robotics technology. It was essentially open season. So why did Meidi have to pay so much more than the market price to get this company? Even the other European companies agree that KUKA was not worth anything near what China offered for it. You could reasonably argue that Meidi was extorted out of a massive price premium because of a vaguely racist, anti-Chinese mood. It's a fair argument. Meidi went above and beyond what any European, American, and Japanese acquirer would have done so to close on KUKA. It sucks for them, and that sour taste in the mouth, along with a much more significant CFIS veto that same month, would deepen the chill between China and the West. The Chinese acquisition spree would come to an end a year later in 2017 as the Chinese government reimposed stronger currency controls. Several large multinationals were required to dispose of their acquisitions. It was for the best for everyone, because by then the mood had shifted and the U.S.-China trade war had begun. Alright everyone, take care of yourselves out there. Stay safe.